This podcast is sponsored by Click Playground. This free programming environment lets you explore and test your data-driven app ideas using Click's engine and APIs. The goal? Less query writing and more efficiency with associative indexing. Visit playground.click.com to learn more and see it for yourself. Welcome to the InfoQ Podcast. My name is Wes Rice and I'm your host. For the last 13 years or so, I've been a software engineer and architect with HP Enterprise Services, working mostly on Java systems in the US. Today, I have the rare chance to chat with some of the most brilliant minds in the software industry as part of my role as the QCon Chair for QCon San Francisco, London, and New York, brought to you by InfoQ. These podcasts are conversations with some of these engineers and software leaders that I get a chance to speak to every day. Today, I'm honored to welcome Sam Newman to the InfoQ podcast. Sam is currently an independent consultant and was previously with Atomist and spent 13 years as a consultant at ThoughtWorks. He is one of the authorities of microservices. On today's podcast, we discuss things like the current pace of adoption of microservices in the industry. We talk about answering questions like how to decide if microservices are really right for you, including things like first principles when it comes to microservices. What do you really need to understand, really have in place before you can adopt them? Then we bridge over and talk about an aspect of microservices that doesn't often get discussed enough, security. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you really enjoy this week's podcast with Sam Newman. Sam, welcome to the InfoQ podcast. Thanks for having me, Wes. I guess about the beginning of this year, you left Atomist. What are you up to these days? I was based in Australia working with Adamis and the team there. And then I'd been thinking about moving back to the UK for a while. But I spent a lot of time traveling and that was getting quite hard on me. And I thought back in the UK, good transport links near my family and everything else. And I thought, what do I do now? And I had no idea. And I thought, OK, well, I'll, I'll take a little bit of work on just people always asking me for help and just to, to give myself a bit of breathing room before I worked out my next steps. And then I discovered that I've started a consultancy. So that's pretty much what happened. My wife and I are now running it full time. So doing basically advisory work with startups, training and consultancy around sort of cloud adoption microservices and sort of CICD, doing that for clients all across Europe and Canada this year. So yeah, I think that makes us global. They're very nice. You wrote a book published early 2015 that is kind of one of the very first books that I remember at least on microservices called Building Microservices. It's a little over two years now. What is the state of microservices today? It's kind of interesting. So the hype around it, I think, has been replaced by people actually trying to do it. I think what you're seeing now are more people asking the hard questions, which is why the hell are you doing it, which I think is actually the right question to ask. So if I talk about the majority of the people I'm speaking to, most of them are organizations. They have existing IT and they are attracted to microservices primarily because they want to go faster. Right. And so they're hearing microservices being talked about. And that sort of, you know, as often is the way you need the larger corporates, often it takes a while for those messages to percolate through. And so now what you've got is a large amount of companies are, are jumping on board saying, yes, this is what we want. Some of those companies are being really smart and savvy about what they're doing. And some of them are just doing it because they've heard about it. And for me, there's, a, there's still a bit of a disconnect between those people that have a really clear understanding about what it is they're getting from a microservice adoption versus those that don't. And like when I spend time with my clients or, or training courses and things, it's, it's the first question I ask. And they say, why should I use microservices? And I say, yeah, yeah, good point. Why should you? What, what is it you're trying to get out of it? And I still think there's a little bit of fuzzy thinking. I think there's still a little bit of they are the golden hammer for the silver bullet, right? Whereas the reality is they are an approach to architecture that has a whole lot of pros and a whole lot of cons. And it still feels to me like people are taking them as that this is the, the ultimate way of doing everything. I think in the wider ecosystem, we're getting some better tools for handling them. I'm having conversations at the moment with people about the service meshes, for example, the stuff like that LinkedIn are doing and Istio are doing. You've got the, the deployment platforms are getting better. And I think both the deployment platforms and those service fabrics, you know, Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry on one hand and the service meshes like Istio and LinkedIn on the other hand, they are they are sort of helping you manage some of the what amazon used to call undifferentiated heavy lifting like the stuff that you just have to deal with that you just don't want to have to deal with some of that gets handled by those platforms but fundamentally you know microservice architectures are a distributed system architecture you can push as much smarts as you want to into the platform or your service mesh whatever you want to call it fundamentally those challenges around distributed systems remain and 
you know, I'm still seeing not a lot of awareness of those fundamental challenges. I don't expect everyone to have a working understanding of the mathematical theories behind cap theory, for example, but to even know it exists and understand what trade-offs that might give people in an organization or to understand why transactions might be difficult in the distributed system or to have heard who Leslie Lamport is. That's maybe not the important point, to understand, but you know, I, I work with people that of building distributed systems and still don't understand that the time doesn't isn't synchronized between machines and there's still some fundamentals of distributed systems that you can't avoid that i'm still seeing a very poor amount of just general penetration into the people understanding i did a talk in shanghai last year and one of the the very first part of that talk was about first principles of microservices and it hit things like cap theorem and, and a few other things when you talk microservices what are first principles don't do it. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean have a good three, reason to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, totally, right. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, one of the analogies I use is like, uh, like when you go to your doctor and you've got an illness, right? Something's wrong with you. They will think about medication to give you, and they'll give you this medication. They'll say, well, the the good side is this medication is going to cure your symptoms. The bad side is it has these side effects that give you maybe other problems. And you know, a doctor hopefully understands the medicine well enough and understands the, you know the physiology of your body and your particular condition to make the right judgment call. You know, is the cure worse than the disease? And microservices are in that sense no different, right? They have these amazing benefits that you can bring if you do them well. And if you do them, even if you do do them well, there's still some downsides. And if you do them badly, oh boy, there's some problems. And so, you know, the thing I keep coming back to from a very, very first principle is actually, do you know why you're doing it? What is the outcome you're trying to achieve? And the thing I try and get from my clients is, can you explain to me actually what benefit your customers are going to get? from you adopting a microservice architecture could you explain it to me in terms that a customer would understand and could you work out if you're achieving the goal you expect and by the way once you've done all that work have you thought of any of the other ways you could achieve those outcomes you're looking for that might not be as sexy like a frequent one is i want to ship software more quickly and it's like great do you measure your cycle time what cycle time well let's talk about what cycle time is and now have you looked at where your actual constraints are in your cycle time. Is it your system architecture or is it actually that, no, actually, if we improve our story, our automated deployment story, we may actually achieve some better benefits. And so really parring it all the way back to that fundamental stuff, it's that. And then the next thing is, if you're going to do this, start really small, start very simple and pull out or either write some new functionality in a brand new service and deploy it into production or extract some existing functionality and deploy it into production, but do like one piece at a time. The key thing I always say is get it into production because a large amount of your learnings are actually going to come from when you're managing this running system. As you were talking about kind of the ecosystem, you talked a bit about service meshes with like Linkerd and Istio. What's the maturity around some of these meshes today? A lot of them are being used by companies quite happily in production, but a lot of the companies that use these quite happily in production, these are startups that are very, very tech savvy, right? So the team at Monzo, I've got friends out here in the UK, used to be called Mondo. They're like a fintech personal banking startup. They love LinkedIn, right? They really love it. And it's handled so many stuff for them. That team is like super sharp and on the point and technical and has always been happy having a degree of we're embracing the cutting edge. And so for me, you know, when you think about, you know, how mature is this stuff, it's not just the technology, it's also your acceptance of the sharp edges around it. Like, am I going to go into a big corporate bank and say, oh, what you need is Istio or Linkerd? I'm, you know, the answer is probably no, because that already presupposes pretty much you're running Kubernetes, right? And a lot of people for Kubernetes, like, I love Kub, it's great. But it's, it's also really quite complicated when all you really want is a simple app platform. So for me, it's as much about, you know, Yes, this stuff is being used in production. Do you have those problems? Is this really the space you want to play in? What's your appetite for biting off another piece of new chain technology, which is sitting on top of Kube, which itself is a fast moving beast? I, I mean, I like it. I do work with the, you know, I, I do sort of do work around the Cloud Native Foundation as well. I think that the platform's going in the right direction, but there's a lot of stuff happening. There's a lot of change there. And some organizations have appetite for the opportunities created by this new technology and they can absorb that. 
other organizations they need stability they need baby steps <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and you know there are other options out there for, for them running platforms because they're also yeah, let's be clear they're not probably going to try and do stuff as advanced as this stuff they're not they don't have the same problems that something so especially in you know solve so you know for me it's like you're already threading a needle of people that are quite happy using cube and they can that next level of help and so at the moment they're definitely not a mass market and they're also not something i'd say you have to use if you're running on cube for example as I was thinking about what we'd talk about for the next half hour or so, um, there are a thousand things, of course, we could talk about with microservices. But what I thought we'd really focus on is something you've been talking a bit about lately, and that's microservice security. Before we dive into security, and there's a blog post you wrote called Microservice Insecurity, Adopting Microservices as Bearing a Series of Trade-Offs and Talking More About Those Trade-Offs. Let's define microservice. In Sam Newman's definition of microservices, what is that? So it's varied a bit over the years, but what I currently say is independently deployable services modeled around a business domain. And that's the top line. This is the Sam Newman definition. I've got to break that down, right? Because that's- Oh, oh I was going to say that the definition has changed from what I heard it because initially it had the word small in there. You've left that out now. Why is it that you've left small out in the new definition? So unfortunately, I'm going to do a brief historical background for this, which I always explain why. The reason small is in the phrase microservice it even comes up, and the reason micro is in microservices is all back down to an old colleague and friend of mine, James Lewis. And James Lewis spotted this interesting style of service-oriented architecture being practiced by a couple of companies, quite a few companies, actually, uh, two of them are Ford Internet, who sort of became U-Switch-ish in the UK, and, and DIW, who are, are, are sort of a... Um, I'll call them an algo trading firm and they'll object, but you know, they can live with it out of Chicago and London. And they were examples of organizations that were sort of creating services that could be very quickly written and thrown away and re-implemented. And they were quite small in terms of scope, quite focused in terms of purpose, and often had small numbers of lines in terms of line count. And so James was calling these micro apps for a long time. And then around 2012, there's a whole bunch of us in a room and we called them micro services. The reality is when you start looking at what they are, that thing that those organizations were practicing was the thing that was, that was yes, there was something about the size and scope of them. They were focused on doing one thing, it was the independent deployable aspect of it. They were properly replaceable components, which is why they could be rewritten and thrown away because they were just replaceable components. And the problem around small and size is that really size isn't that helpful a lot of the time because what does size mean to people, right? Is it lines of code and like, does that carry the shared libraries you're pulling in? Is some problem domains are more complex than others? It was interesting that both you know Google and Netflix both self-identified as being organizations that implemented microservice architectures. They used to call themselves service-oriented architectures. They now talk about themselves in terms of microservice architectures. Their services aren't 50 lines of code. You know, Netflix's services are you know many thousands of lines of code. And so actually the size in terms of numbers of line of code doesn't really help us that much. So the thing I try and get people to focus on is actually, you know, size, yes, yeah, size is like a maximizer because what you get down to, if you make things smaller, you're going to have more of them. And if you've worked out how to make these services work well for you, having more of them could give you more benefits. James is a, loves saying that uh, it's a really good phrase, actually, that microservices buy you options. And with more microservices, you have more options. The flip side is there's a load more things you've got to manage. There are loads more problems you know, that you've got to deal with in terms of resiliency, reliability, management, scale, everything else. And so I actually realized over time that the size aspect wasn't really the important thing. Focusing on making these things independently deployable and really explaining to people the thing they need to focus on was there's probably a certain number of these in my current stages of understanding this problem space and my maturity, I can handle like 20 of these things right now and beyond that it really hurts me and so i focus much more on how many of these things you have more than the size of the individual pieces yeah makes sense all right so let's talk about it in relationship to security so one of the first concepts you learn as a fledgling architect is defense in depth when you're setting up security defense in depth is an IA concept where you have different levels of security at different boundaries or areas of the system of course you know that how does that defense in depth change when we're talking about services? Is it now a service boundary? Is it a seam? What does defense in depth mean to a microservice? Well, I mean, ultimately, you know, when you think about a service, these are independently deployable things that talk over networks. You are taking systems that might previously be sort of more monolithically deployed code bases, and you're breaking those things apart. Therefore, you're effectively creating 
multiple potential boundaries at which your application could be defended. You know, I don't have all of my data in one database anymore. I've got that split up. The main example I use a lot is this idea of an online shop that's selling CDs online. It's a very cutting edge business, right? So, you know, now I've got my information stored about my customers' PII is in, is in one system. My payments information is in another system. My catalog information is in another system. Now, think about those things. that I, I've broken those things apart. They're now in separate service boundaries. Those service boundaries can be defended independently from each other. And likewise, if an attacker breaks into one of those services, they haven't necessarily broken into the other services. So I've created effectively multiple potential places at which my application could be defended. And I've made it much harder if my attacker wants to gain access to all of my information to get access to all of that information. And I also allow myself the ability to really focus my attention on those aspects of my system that are more sensitive than others. You know, if, if all of my stuff is in one database, as an example, you know, I've got to, to an extent, I'm, I'm as worried about my least sensitive information as my most sensitive information, because it's all in one basket, it's all in one place. But, you know, the example of, say, my product catalog, I don't actually care if someone gets access to my product catalog because, oh, great, they can read Justin Bieber's greatest hits is 1999. That's information that's on my website anyway. I don't want them to manipulate that information, but I don't care if they get it. But, you know, my customer's PII data, that's that's like, wow, that's, you know, that's, that's stuff that's, I've got to be really, you know, really anal about and place a large degree of care and attention about. And so, you know, a, a Microsoft's architecture does give you that ability to create those defense in depth and really allow you to focus your attention on those part systems that you really care about. And I think potentially as well could make implementing some of the auditing requirements and things like PCI compliance. Theoretically, those things could become easier with a system architecture that's designed in the right way. Sure, sure. Of course, there's a lot of trade-offs, right? So what you're trading for, you're gaining some complexity in data over the wire and things like that, that in the past were all in memory, right? Absolutely. I mean, this is the flip side, right? So Microsoft is given, they take away, right? They you know suddenly all this information that used to flow within a single process or certainly on the same machine is now flowing across networks between processes. And that drastically increases your surface area for that information to be observed and, and read, and also for that information to be manipulated. And then you also potentially open up some really interesting problems around people being able to masquerade as both clients and services. Early on, the reason I started looking into security really was because I realized that so many of the clients I was working with were just running their microservices over their, you know, their internal corporate networks without any thought about who could access the information because these were sort of attack surface areas I hadn't considered before. And I had to explain, well, anybody on your network could not just look at that information, but manipulate it. And... There's even some other more insidious attacks. I was chatting to uh, Adrian about the other day, and you know, he said one of the nastiest ones is, you know, as an attacker, you could just like launch a node and join it onto a Kubernetes cluster and say, yeah, I'll take some jobs off your hands. And then suddenly people are running workloads on a non-compromised machine. You know, there's some really nasty things out there. And, and this is that thing together where, yes, you get the potential to create systems that are more secure. But I actually think if you've got a naive stance around or you know but a poor awareness around security not thinking about this carefully i actually think you could end up creating systems that are less secure than say more monolithically deployed applications is this just a case that it just needs to be HTTPS everywhere or are there other approaches that we should be considering? A lot depends on the protocols you're using. I mean, yeah, if you're using HTTP protocols, then you know, HTTPS is not a bad start. I mean, it's quite easy to do nowadays, but you, you have to understand what that gives you. You know, HTTPS is, is great on the public internet because it gives you trust the website you go to is actually the website you go to. And so inside your corporate perimeter, it's just giving you the same thing, right? Oh, I'm going to my invoice services.com. Well, so my inverse of services.net, my internal service. I know that's really is the invoice service, right? That is the e thing it claims to be. And that's only one way trust, right? That maybe limits the ability for people to masquerade as that service inside your microservice architecture, assuming you've done the right things around the certificates, of course. And it will also protect the data in transit, right? It's not going to be manipulated. You protect yourself and that sort of thing. But you've got no client guarantees. Right. So I could run my payment service, you know, receive my credit card payment details for my buying my CDs online. And I'm running that over HTTPS. And that's great. But I may not stop just a random person connecting to me. 
you know, it's like, uh, you know, we worry about our, you know, protecting our data at rest. And yeah, I'm going to encrypt my data at rest, but I run that data over a, you know, a database instance that anyone can talk to. I mean, this is the same thing here, right? Yes, you're running HTTPS, but unless you're also validating that the client is allowed to connect, that anybody could just actually ask a service and extract all the data it wants with some nice, well-formed REST API. It's like you're making the hackers' lives easier. So going beyond something like HTTPS anywhere, if you're looking at, say, a HTTP-based protocol, you're going to have to look at client authentication schemes. So client-side certificates, stuff like HMAC, uh, are in there as well. And that's just a way of saying, you know, whether when we're talking about service-to-service -service communication, that the, you know, that we talk about producer-consumer, that the consumer is talking to a producer it trusts and a producer knows that the consumer that's talking to it is somebody that's allowed to talk to it. And so, yeah, client-side certificates, you know, something like HMAC, those are the sorts of protocols you then start looking at to get that second level of trust in that environment. Yeah, I think one of your talks that I recently watched, you talked about some recommendations on how to manage that, like a CI, CD pipeline. What were some of the things that uh, you recommend to manage all these certs that you might be generating? Yeah, this is this just gets difficult. Historically, there's been quite problematic. Cert, cert management uh, was always painful um, for server side certificates in a HTTPS environment. Uh, if you're on Amazon, there are some good solutions there. Just don't cut it out of the box. You can also, of course, look at Let's Encrypt, their Acme protocol, which other people can adopt as well. Gives you a very good way to issue non wildcarded uh, certificates, and actually has an automated command for reissuing those certificates as well. And that's something you can very easily build in. Client side certificate management that you're sort of all automated frameworks on top of that are thin on the ground. Netflix's Lima stuff was announced in 2015. I'm still not seeing many great examples of organizations using it outside of Netflix. I've certainly seen lots of people jury rig systems like that using Puppet and Chef pushing certificates out and people again putting stuff on top of Amazon. I think the client side certificate management is something there's still scope for improvement there. The one thing I haven't dipped into a lot is looking at what the service meshes are doing here. Both LinkedIn and Istio really shine in the space of you know, supporting people doing point-to-point -point synchronous communication in Microsoft architectures. Theoretically, they have the ability to make this stuff better. I haven't yet dived into what solutions they offer in this space yet, though. So you use this model in one of your talks that was about a security model about kind of prevention, detection, response, and recovery. I want to discuss all those different things in context of maybe a service. So you mentioned earlier, one of the things you'd like to talk about is this kind of CD, selling of CDs online. So if that's our use case, if that's what we're trying to do, can you kind of, from a high level architecture, where are the security bits, where are the service bits in that particular architecture? Then let's kind of dive into prevention, detection, response, and recovery. The very first thing I think you need to start with is, is some very, very basic form of threat modeling to, to really understand what it is that you're worried about. Uh, I think we often get distracted with technology and the shiny stuff, but really you've got to separate out the things you really care about, the things that you don't care about, and what are the things you're most worried about someone getting their hands on. So if I think about an organization that's selling CDs online, I mean, we kind of touched on it earlier, you know, the things that I'm drawn towards immediately are any information about my customer, uh, their credit card information, those sorts of things. And so then what you would do is you'd say, OK, well, the goal is for some outside malicious party to gain access to these things. Then let's think based on that, what approach we need to take to protecting that information. And so, you know, in the case of, you know, I think you know, so the catalog information is public. Who cares? Right. Customer data. Don't want them messing around with that. Don't want them my payments information. That stuff is, is also pretty clear. Those things actually are often fairly easy to identify. What are your crown jewels in that type of situation? So customer might be the crown jewel in this particular situation, right? Our, our credit card is. We'll say that's outsourced, so we'll, we'll say it's customer information. Yeah, we would need to talk about credit card, though, because even if it depends on how you integrate it with your payment provider, right? If you're doing, say, pure browser-based handoff to, say, a third-party payment gateway, then yes, you can outsource that to an extent. If you're talking to a payment gateway on your back end and those credit cards ever flow over your net, your, your system, you, you know, you've got to think about the fact that that information that is vulnerable is now flowing over networks. If it goes over your network, it immediately becomes something you care about and credit card data is in there. And that would definitely make you, oh, hang on, PCI level two, I think, even if you don't actually handle the payment, if you, if you, if you pass that stuff through, beyond the fact you've now got the PCI stuff that kicks in, you've just got a duty of care to that information. And so what you were talking about before with client-side certificates and SSL, if it's HTTPS, is that enough? Or what, what else should we consider? 
Well, those things can help you avoid the information being sniffed on the wire, captured in airport lounges, and it can stop those things being manipulated. There are still a bunch of other potential issues you've got to deal with. I mean, the very first one is, well, what happens when that data starts moving around? So if it's in memory on a machine or whatever, can that machine have access to it? Have you patched your machine? I was doing some research recently, it's like 44% of sort of data breaches in organizations are caused by unpatched machines. So they are breached by vulnerabilities caused by things that have been previously identified and the patches have been issued for that people just haven't applied, right? And so that information, once it hits the machine, if that inf- machine is being breached because it's not being patched properly, and that's a real basic thing, like are you patching your machines every week? And an embarrassing number of people aren't. Then you decide to save it somewhere. Okay, I'm now saving it in a database. Well, are you worried about the encryption of the data at rest there? Is that something you've got to worry about? Before Kubernetes 1.7, for example, you could store secrets in Kubernetes. And those secrets were stored in plain text in etcd. So that meant if anyone gave access to etcd, instantly in Kubernetes, they could see your information. But you thought it was a secret. And it's like, you have to think about where it's then going to sit. And sort of those are the real basic things. You know, patch your machines, think about data at rest, think about data in transit. And then once you've dealt with those low hanging sort of basic prevention mechanisms, I think then you're looking into sort of more harder to spot problems and that sometimes require more advanced attackers, but can easily be things that you miss. And, and, and a great example of that would be something like a confused deputy problem, which is a little bit complicated. But the way to think about it is that stuff we were talking about before, which is like client side and server side certificates, for example, that creates a situation where, oh, the user service really believes that it's the web shop talking to it. And the web shop really believes it's talking to the user service. And those two things say, yes, you can talk to me and I trust that you are the who you say you are. And that's great. And that's sort of service to service trust. And then you can put cryptographic protocols on top of that to protect the information as it flows across the system. But then I've got me as a logged in user. I'm logged in as Sam and I log in. I go to the web shop and say, can I see Sam's information? And the web shop says, well, you're logged in. I'm going to go ask the user shop, the user service for Sam's information. The user service says, and he goes, user service, can I have Sam's information? The user service goes, yes, here's Sam's information. The web shop gets that information and passes it back to me on a web page. That's great. And then I go, web shop, can I have Alice's information? You know, this could just be me crafting a different response from my browser to the web shop on the back end. Unless the web shop knows I shouldn't use ask for Alice's information, it may just pass that request downstream. And the user service, a lot of people just embrace this idea of implicit trust. The user service assumes that any request that comes from the web shop must be okay because it's my buddy, the web shop. We hang out together. We know we go to we go to parties together. He wouldn't ask me for bad stuff. And all that's happening is that because the, the web shop isn't the user service, doesn't know about users. That's why we've got the user service, right? So it sort of passes, it proxies that request through almost. And unless it filters it and spots that it's not allowed to ask for that sort of information, then you have to rely on the user service knowing that it's not allowed. And then you get into this interesting problem of really then the user service needs to ask not only one, if the service is talking to me, someone I should listen to. So in this case, it's the web shop. Yes, I should. And then two, are they asking for information on behalf of the user that I should let them have that information? This is the classic case of authentication authorization, right? Exactly. That's a big difference, right? So this is an example of a confused deputy problem, right? If you can trick the web shop into asking the user service for information it shouldn't ask for, this is just one example of the confused deputy problem. And so then what you start doing is you start getting into situations where I am logged in as Sam. There's information about my logged in state. So yes, I'm definitely Sam. And here's what Sam is allowed to do. And then you sort of have this nested trust thing. The web shop asks the user service on behalf of me for some information. And then the user service has to validate firstly, one, should I listen to the web shop? And then two, if I should listen to the web shop, yes, I should, it's good. The information they're passing me about the person they're asking on behalf of, should I trust the information? Can I then release that information to that other person? In practicality, you're talking about like some kind of interceptor that sits in front of a service that is checking like an ACL to verify that you're authenticated, but you're also authorized to get to that data. Is that accurate? 
Yeah, typically I would put some sort of interceptor for a logged in state, uh, probably at the perimeter, probably your, your your public internet perimeter. And then what I would expect is that anything you get redirected after you do your sign in, whatever else. And then to the most common solution nowadays for Microsoft architectures, you're looking at something like a token based mechanism, uh, JSON Web Tokens being a good example. What comes back is a token that represents me. That token can be independently validated, basically, basically using sort of uh, using public, uh, private keys and things, and that token could encode more information about myself. So that when the web shop makes a call down to the user service, it says, "Oh, hi, can I have Alice's data? Oh, and by the way, here's the token for the person I'm asked that's asking." And then the user service gets to look at that token understand the logged in person and make its own determination on whether or not it listens. The kind of interesting thing is when you start having centralized ACLs for all of this stuff is it kind of flies in the face of what Microsoft architecture is trying to do, right? So this is the real problem. And so if you really put, okay, the logic around the user service is in the user service, well, it knows users, it knows the domain of that stuff. And so it seems silly to then go out to a third party system. Some of the authorization schemes I've seen require additional round trips at this point, right? So rather than the user service being able to make its own determination, it has to go off again and check things again. And then, you know, if you think about call chains where every point around the call chain, every call that I send downstream has to go back and check to some sort of centralized auth service, it becomes hugely burdensome. Beyond the increased surface area failure, synchronous calls, synchronous temporally coupled calls are always a fraught activity, it's slow, right? Something like a JWT token approach where when I give the token to the user service, the user service is able to validate if that's a valid token without requiring any round trips. And I can put quite a bit of information in those things. It then gets to make its own decision locally about what it does with that information. Earlier, you said something like 44% of the security vulnerabilities in microservices are around simply just unpatched servers. That's not microservice architecture. That's systems full stop. Just system in general. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, does that mean the panacea, the silver bullet is serverless architecture where Amazon will, or whomever will guarantee that your server is fully patched? Uh, Yeah, I mean, potentially, but that's not the whole story. So if you think about what patched means, yes, you've got the operating systems and all that sort of stuff. And obviously, and and potentially, you know, some sort of, you know, containing application process you're running on like cube cluster node or whatever else. And so, yeah, the service architecture, that's been handled for you, but your application is still running on that service architecture, right? That is your Node app, your Python app, your Java app. And those things also require care and attention. They also have security vulnerabilities, right? And have you patched those things? Luckily, at least with the application world, I think there are some really good tools out there. There's a tool I really like called SNYK, S-N-Y-K. And one of the things they do is they look at your like uh, Maven dependencies or your gem file and say, okay, you depend on these versions of these commonly used libraries. Oh, we've spotted a CVE in this one. You really should upgrade to this other new version and they can alert you. And they can even, one of the cool things they've added is like the ability to even send you a GitHub PR to update your dependencies with the latest patch versions, right? And these services are out there. They're far from the only one. And so, yes, you avoid the need for and the service architecture. You're not as worried about, OK, I've got to run you know, my application service. I'm not worrying about that. You've still got your application to worry about. And there's still with these service architectures, I mean, we banded the term around. There's actually, it's not just functions. I mean, you know, if you think about it, yes, there are functions, but there's also back ends of the service, which are under the banner of serverless. Those are persistent running services. Their attack service area is different. You know, there's this stuff like this idea if your function isn't running, it isn't there. We know that's not actually true on Lambda, for example, because certainly for JVM-based processes, they have to spin your thing up and keep it warm. Otherwise, the response times are too poor. So it's not entirely true. I think from security in general, it's mostly, certainly with function as a service, it's mostly a good story. But it's not the whole story, and there are other issues around serverless. I was going to ask you exactly that. What are some of the, I guess, maybe new security issues that you might not be thinking about when you move to serverless? I think the part of the problem is that when we start thinking about prevention and some of the mechanisms we use for, for securing our systems and detecting our systems are secure, there are a lot of them IP-based, as in we are things that are looking at networks. And, you know, obviously a a function is something that potentially is going to run at some point. So it's not running right now. So, you know, looking at it is difficult. And so a lot of you're you're, you're sort of, you're actually now looking less at 
the running thing and more how you set the thing up. It's almost a shift from looking at IP based security to API based security. Like, how have you set up your Amazon job? Have you done anything odd? Have you left these weird port? You know, it's not like, oh, is this IP port open? But how is your account set up? Are there some weird structures going on there that, that could be in the mix? I think mostly for security, it, the story is good, to be honest with you. I think the, the fundamentals are still there really around some of these things. And I think actually Amazon in particular certainly has always done a fairly good job about this. I mean, their secure by default approach to their to how they handle those things is good. People, of course, still do silly things before experience's sake, like opening up all their access to all of these things. There are other challenges around service architectures that aren't specific to security but i think on this front that certainly you know if you're moving some of your functionality over into functions as a service it does take away some of your headaches we've been chatting with sam newman of microservices fame if you want to learn more about sam's views on microservices security service meshes or anything else related to microservices you can easily find them online additionally this upcoming march at qcon london we'll be partnering with sam and several others to deliver a variety of workshops that dive into some of these topics so if you're in Europe, you can bookmark your calendars for QCon in March. Sam, thanks for talking. You're welcome. Thanks, Wes.